So I'm already impressed with the fact that we have um, people taking the notes. It's more than my uh, students do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just an outline of what I'll be telling you about later then. Um, I'll give you a, an introduction to dark matter, what we know about dark matter at the moment, and why we want to study it. I'm going to talk about using gravitational lensing as a means of quantifying the amount and the distribution of dark matter in the universe. So I'll give you a, a brief tour of how we how gravitational lensing works, and then talk about how we apply gravitational lensing in trying to measure the amount of dark matter in the universe. And then having done that, having gone through the theory of lensing and how we use it, what do we actually learn when we apply it to gravitational lensing to try and understand the distribution of dark matter in the universe? So, um, if you want to ask questions whilst I'm going along, please feel free to stick your hand up, it's no problem at all. We'll start off then by talking about uh, motivating lensing, um, and that is all about trying to measure and quantify this thing that we uh, refer to now as dark matter in the universe. So it all started in 1933 with this fellow, uh, Fritz Zwicky, was a Swiss astronomer, a bit of a, a cantankerous character by all accounts. Referred to his colleagues as spherical, I'm going to use the word blighters, that wasn't the word that he used. Um, when, you can probably guess which word he, he used to start with B. Uh, when asked why spherical, he said, because they're blighters no matter which way you look at them. Um, he was a, a very um, inspirational character for many. He made lots of discoveries. He discovered neutron stars and supernovae. He even made a prediction that galaxies will act like gravitational lenses. He's, there are reports of him getting his, uh, his postgraduate students, whilst observing, to fire bullets along the line of sight that he was observing along, the theory being that the shock wave from the bullet would somehow smooth out the air column that he was observing. Of course, it never worked, but it was a nice idea. But what Fritz Zwicky did was analyse the motions of galaxies in the coma cluster. So here's a picture of the coma cluster. The faint, sort of beige, yellow, creamy coloured objects are elliptical galaxies that, that belong in the coma cluster. And what Fritz did was to look at the speeds of, of the motions of these galaxies. And we can do that by looking at the Doppler shift of the light that comes from these galaxies. And he was in for a big surprise when he did this because he realised that the speeds of these galaxies are way higher than they should be for this system to not tear itself apart. We know this cluster has been around for an awful long time and it hasn't torn itself apart. The only way that we can explain this is by having to have way more mass than we can see. Okay, so there needs to be much more mass in the coma cluster to allow these large velocities so that this thing doesn't tear itself apart. So how, how do we know that? Well, we, we can measure something called the dynamical mass. That's how much mass there has to be in the coma cluster so that it doesn't tear itself apart. And we can compare the dynamical mass with the mass that we can see. Okay? So we can observe the galaxies, we can measure the amount of light, and we can, we can work out how much mass we can see that's there in the result. So how do we do that? Well, we can do a simple experiment, a simple thought experiment. So we know how massive the sun is. We know how much light the sun emits. So if we make a simple assumption that a given galaxy that we observe is made of stars just like our sun, and we place, we work out how much light the sun would emit if it were placed at the distance of the galaxy that we're observing, then we simply take all of the light from the galaxy, divide it by the light from the sun that it would have at that distance, and then that number is the number of solar masses that the galaxy would have. Of course, galaxies are not made of all stars that are all like our sun. There's a range of massive stars, and they're not just made of stars, they're made of gas and dust. But we can make pretty reliable corrections now. It gives us good measure um, of the visible mass. And when you go back to the coma cluster, and this is what Zwicky did, he found that in order for this system not to tear itself apart, for these gravitationally bound um, galaxies not to tear themselves apart, there needs to be about a hundred times more mass there than we can account from, from the, the visible mass. So this is this was the idea of, of dark matter. Um, at the time, Zwicky assumed it was just missing normal stuff, things like um, planets that don't emit light and lots of gas and dust. But we now know that it, it can't be that for various reasons. So that was in um, the, uh, the, the early 30s. 
no one really took that result too seriously until 1939 when a chap called Horace Barcock came along and as part of his PhD work did a very, very similar analysis. He looked at the, the motion of stars in the outskirts of the Andromeda galaxy. So what you do is you look at the speed of the stars at large distances from the center and you find the same thing. The motion of the stars in these large, in these large radii are it's, it's, moving too quickly. The galaxy should tear itself apart if the only mass that's there is the stuff that we can see. So all this stuff in the middle, if that's the only mass there, there's not enough mass to provide enough gravity to allow these high velocities. So again, um, this gives rise to the fact that there is missing mass in the universe. And it's called dark because we can't see it. It doesn't appear to emit great length of uh, emit light in any way. So that was 1939. In the 1960s, obviously the World War II got in the way, in the 1960s, we carried out simulations of disk galaxies. So what we're looking at here is um, a disk galaxy. I've got a kind of talk. A disk galaxy, so you start off with um, a disk that is composed of 100,000 particles. So I'm, I'm amazed, actually, that in the 1960s we had computers powerful enough to run these simulations. But that disk at T equals to zero has 100,000 particles in it. And what you do is you simulate the evolution of that disk. So you start with all these particles off moving in circular orbits in this galaxy. And you, you go to a given particle and you ask, what is the net gravitational force on that one particle due to all of the particles in the disk? Okay, so you work out the, the net force on that one particle. You go to another particle and you do the same thing. You ask, what is the net force on this next particle due to all the other particles in the disk? And you do this for all the particles in the disk until you've worked out the net force on all those particles. And then you make a small time step. Now, if a particle has a force on it, it has an acceleration on it, so you can work out where the next particle will be in the next time step. So that's the essence of how these simulations work. And when they did this, you can see from these um, snapshots that T equals 0.5, you've still got a disk, it's spread out a little bit. At T equals 1, you're starting to get the um, emergence of some famous spiral arms, and you see that again, T is 1.5. But at T is 2, I don't know what these time units are, something I'm not going to show you time units. You get this really strong bar feature. And then by T is 2.5, only an instant later, the bar has completely gone, and the galaxy starts to tear itself apart. What they found was that these disks are completely unstable. If you have a collection of mass as a disk and you start off rotating, it tears itself apart in no time. And these bar-like features are very, very transient events. So when we look in the real universe, we shouldn't see any barred galaxies because it happens in the, in the snap of the finger. But when we look in the real universe, we do find lots of spiral galaxies with bars. They're quite common. So there's something amiss here. And the way in which they managed to solve this dilemma was to redo their simulations. But instead of having an isolated disk of mass, they put their disk in um, a halo of dark matter, a large spherical halo. And then that large spherical halo provides the necessary gravity to keep the disk stable, and then you can have nice stable disks with spiral arms and bars in the right sort of ratio that we observe in the universe. So another bit of evidence that suggests that galaxies are surrounded by these large amounts of dark matter. So the picture that you should have in your mind now is that when we look at an isolated galaxy like this, what we're seeing in, in the visible is something like this, but what's really there is something way more extended. So the, the blue shading here is meant to represent the dark matter halo. And it makes up about, we can see I've changed the there, it makes up about 85% of the mass of the galaxy. So a huge amount of the mass that's present in galaxies is simply not there. Uh, it's, it's not visible. And a really nice analogy here is an iceberg, because the numbers are about the same. So the iceberg that we see floating above the sea, the tip of the iceberg, accounts for about an eighth of the mass of the overall iceberg. The remaining seven-eighths of the mass of the iceberg, which is akin to the dark matter of galaxies, is submerged beneath the surface. So, um, the question is, what is dark matter? I've told you about observational evidence. What is it? Well, if we look at the, um, the standard model of particle physics, we can, we can start addressing what we think it might be. We know that it's not baryons. Okay? So a baryon is something that has three quarks in it. So a proton, 
of the neutron, the things that make up atomic nuclei, they're barren ones. So the uh, proton has two up quarks and one down quark, and the neutron has two down quarks and one up quark. They are barren ones. We know from some, um, actually, fairly straightforward physics to do with how elements were created at the very beginning of the universe, that the processes that were um, at play during those early times couldn't create the additional amount of baryonic mass, the stuff that we're made of, the table line, the meaning of the, the whole of the Earth is made of ions. The formation of these elements in the early universe couldn't produce all this missing mass. It has to be non baryonic it has to be something other than the stuff made of protons and neutrons. Well, it could simply be clouds of electrons or clouds of muons or, or something like that, quarks, okay? Because so they're still non baryons they, they still wouldn't have gone to form the elements that would make us. But there are other bits of observational evidence that help us rule out what these are the possibilities are. So let's go through um, in terms. So what you're looking at here is a list of all of the current particles in the standard model, uh, model of, of particle physics. So you have the green leptons, so you'll be familiar with the electron, maybe the muon. That also includes the neutrinos, you've heard of the neutrinos. The purple are the quarks, so I mentioned the up and the down that make up protons and neutrons. But there are things like the charm and the strange and the top and the bottom. And then all the, the red particles are bosons. And again, you'll have, you'll have heard of photons, you might have heard of the Higgs boson. And these are the, the particles that carry forces. So let's, let's go through and look at the, uh, the properties that these particles have to have to satisfy all of the criteria that we know about dark matter particles. The first one is it has to be electrically neutral. Okay? Your particle has to be electrically neutral. If you take an electrically charged particle and you accelerate it, it emits a photon. It emits light. So that straight away rules out any particle that's charged. Right? It can't be charged because it would be luminous and we would see it without our telescopes. So straight away rule out all of those particles. None of the, none of the quarks that go because they're all charged. And the electron, the muon, and the tau are all charged as well. So they all get ruled out. Dark matter has to have non zero mass. We know it's there because of its gravitational influence. Think of the motion of the material around the galaxy, okay? The, 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 the material that is making dark matter has to have mass, so that it has to have, so that it produces a gravitational field. Um, well, all of the particles um, that have zero mass, well, it's the photons and the blue ones, so they get ruled out. It has to be stable. This stuff has been around for a long time, since the, um, the birth of the universe. We see the effects of dark matter and the rotation curves are very, very distant and therefore early galaxies. So um, we know that uh, the, the other remaining Higgs boson and the, the Z boson are very unstable. They, they just do very, very rapidly and are not involved in atomic physics. So the only things that are left in this model are the neutrinos. So could the neutrinos be responsible for dark matter? Is all this dark matter in the universe literally big clouds of neutrinos? Well, we can, uh, again, ask some questions about that. So you've probably seen these simulations where we simulate a universe in a box, and it's much like the simulation I talked about before, where you start off with the disk of particles now, you have a three-dimensional box, and you randomly distribute your particles, and you do the same thing. You ask, what is the net force on this one particle due to all the other particles? You do that for all the particles in the box, and eventually your box forms structures. Now what we can do in creating a universe like this is we can play around with the physics. We can try different initial conditions, we can give the particles different masses, we can change the way the forces behave and therefore the way the particles interact with each other. <clears throat> and one of the things we can do is we can simulate what kind of a universe we would get if dark matter were made of neutrinos. So here's an example of three different universes that have all started off in exactly the same way would have been simulated with different dark matter particles. On the right is where the particles are all moving slowly, at slow speed, at slow speeds. In this universe, the particles move so slowly that they can stick together quite early on in the universe's history and, and make very, very clumpy structures. On the left is particles that are moving very, very quickly, and they're moving so quickly that gravity doesn't really have a chance to capture them. So the structures that they form tend to be larger and smoother. There's one in the middle, it's a sort of hybrid of two where the particles are moving as an in-between kind of speed. The neutrinos are the ones on the left. Neutrinos make very, very smooth structures in the universe. They don't make 
galaxy clusters anywhere near what we observe in the universe. They don't make galaxies like what we observe in the universe. So these simulations rule out neutrinos. So none of these particles in the standard model fit the bill. It can't be anything that we know of. It's got to be some new exotic form of mass. Lensing, is a, a gravitational lensing, is a, is a fantastic tool for being able to study dark matter. So I'm just going to tell you through, talk you through how gravitational lensing works and what it's all about. Anyone got any questions so far, by the way? Sorry, in the column that forms the exposed, there's nothing below it. Oh, um, and yet, it's back. Yeah, yeah. It's also back. So yeah. it's a bit like the periodic table where you're missing elements that you don't know about. Possibly. Are there both of them not being discovered which are greater mass than these? Good yes. question. We don't know. Could be. At the moment, the um, standard model is quite well described by all of these. There are, apart from us not knowing what dark matter is, there really, I don't think, are any sort of missing things in physics that require additional particles. Um, you probably heard something called string theory, which is a way of trying to um, combine gravity and all of the other forces. Gravity is a bit of a strange force in that we're uh, physicists are having a hard time trying to unify the force of gravity with the other forces. Um, and so there's a, a theory called string theory or supersymmetry, which involves doubling up on all of these particles. So in supersymmetry, every single particle you see here has a supersymmetric partner. Um, but this, there's still no observation evidence that we need to turn into such um, drastic levels of physics. But people are playing around with those sorts of ideas. Um, right, so gravitational lensing. So the way it works is as I've shown in this diagram here. So on the left, we have an observer. So that's us on Earth. There is, in the, the distance, um, a background source, so something that's producing light. And on its way to us, there is something in the middle, something that is deflecting the light path. So something in the middle, which I've labeled deflect here, has, this one's not very good, has a mass, and that warped space-time, which means that the, the light, which would have missed the observer, okay, if that deflector hadn't been there, the light would have missed the observer, and we wouldn't have observed it can be bent by the gravitational field so that we see the background source. Okay? Now the source, any, anything with mass in the universe will, will bend light. The sorts of systems I'm going to be talking about, the things that I've spent a lot of my time studying, are where the background source is a very, very distant galaxy, and the deflector is another galaxy that lies close to us. So this idea um, has been sort of quantified properly by Einstein, but the idea has been around for a long time, even um, around Newton's time when he was developing this theory of gravity. It was, it was predicted that um, a massive object would bend in light. So what happens? Well, the light ray gets bent by a deflector like that, which means that we don't see the background source where it is. We see an image of the source somewhere else. So this is a bit like looking at fish in a pond. If you're standing looking down into a pond, you see an image of a, of a goldfish, where you see the fish is not really where the fish is. The fish is actually slightly closer to you than the image of the fish that you see. So if you're spear fishing, you have to throw your spear um, not where you see the fish, but slightly in the front. Um, exactly the same with, with gravitational lensing. So Newton, if you use Newton's law of gravity to make a prediction of where you would see the image, you find that it's different by the prediction that Einstein makes by a factor of two. Einstein predicts that the deflection angle, so how much that ray is being bent by, is twice as big as the deflection angle that you calculate if you use Newtonian gravity. So when Einstein made this prediction, the race was on to see whether this was actually true. Could we make an observation that would verify Einstein's observations, not Einstein's theory? And so in 1919, uh, it turned out that Arthur Wellington travelled to Africa because at that time in Africa there was a, an eclipse of the sun. And at this time, the galaxies weren't really um, known about. We didn't have telescopes powerful enough to be able to probe high redshift galaxies and study the phenomenon of lensing by galaxies. The most massive object that we were aware of um, that would act like a lens was the sun. Now, what you want to be able to do is take a, an image of the, of the sun and measure the position of a star behind the sun in the theory that the light from that star will be bent by the gravitational field of the sun. Obviously, when we look at the sun, in the daytime, we don't see any stars, right? The sky is 
dies, um, uh, probably very bright because of scattered light from the sun. But in a solar eclipse, you can't see stars. You can see stars right close to the edge of the sun. So what Arthur Eddington did was, he travelled to Africa, he measured the positions of lots of stars around the edge of the sun um, during the solar eclipse, and then he waited six months when the sun's on the other part of the sky, and he went back and he re-measured all of the positions of the stars. And he found that they had deflected. And not only had they deflected, but they had um, been removed by the prediction that Einstein made, not the prediction that Newton made. So this was um, a triumph for Einstein, his prediction had made this, um, this prediction that was, that was experimentally verified. One of the many things that have gone on to verify Einstein's theory of general relativity. So if you want to Wikipedia, you can see this image here. This is the image that um, Eddington took, and that's what it's published. Um, and it's quite hard to tell from where you're sitting, but there are a few stars that highlight them. If you go onto the Wikipedia page, you'll, you'll see some of the stars being highlighted, and they're the ones that we used in this analysis. So how does this help us? What's this got to do with, with dark matter? Well, the physics is really quite straightforward. Okay? So the amount by which that light ray bends, so I've labelled this as alpha. If you don't like equations, don't worry, I can explain it qualitatively. The amount by which the light bends is proportional to the mass, so all that means is that if I have more mass, it warps space-time more, and the light gets more bent. And if my light wave is closer to the mass, so that's the distance r in this diagram, it gets bent more as well. So the closer the light wave, the more it's bent, the more mass, the more light is bent. So if we can measure r, if we can measure how close our light wave is getting into our galaxy, and we can measure alpha, which we can do, then we can measure him. And that's the essence of gravitational limiting. We can measure the mass of these things. Now, what I've drawn here is just one possible way that the light can get from the source to the observer. When the source lies directly behind the lens, there are, there are other ways in which the light can make it to the observer. So you could have a light ray that goes above and below. And in fact, this is just a two-dimensional representation of what's happening in three-dimensional space. I could equally imagine a ray that comes out of the screen, or one that goes into the screen. Okay, so there's a, there's a um, multitude of ways in which the light can make it to ourselves from a, a background source, as it's being lensed by this foreground lens of the galaxy. Um, and we see this in the universe. So this is a, a very famous uh, image of a strong gravitational lens system. So what you're looking at here is a foreground galaxy, so that's the deflector that I was showing you in the diagram. That's what that yellow blob is in the centre. It's an elliptical galaxy that lies between us and a background source. So can you see... Um, this is my point of work on this out. Okay, this little blue blob at the top here, that is what you would see if that foreground elliptical galaxy weren't positioned slap bang on it. You would see a very, very small and, and relatively faint image of a background source. But by taking that small source and putting it directly behind that elliptical galaxy, you get this really impressive, large and bright Einstein ring, as it's called. This is called cosmic portion. But you can't guess what. Astronomers are terrible at giving labels to things, as you probably uh, encounter before with, with naming things like telescopes, very large telescopes, extremely large telescopes. The same with that these systems. There's another one called the Cosmic Eye. It's a very similar system, but it's more elongated and it looks a bit like an eye. So these are the sorts of systems that I study. So what's happening here is this, um, there's a, there's this background, actually highly star-forming and young galaxy is being lensed into this image by this foreground. This but it's not just these so-called galaxy-galaxy systems that create these images, we, we find um, these lensing features up here in clusters as well. So this is a, a famous cluster, Abel 2018. Because the cluster is bigger, there's a greater chance that more objects that lie behind it will be gravitationally lensed, and, and we see this in this image. So if you look closely, you can see there are lots of arcs and things like this arc here is from a red galaxy that is lying behind the cluster. There's another arc there, there's one there. They're, they're all over the image. But I'm not going to concern myself with these things. These are very, very complicated systems to analyse and, and learn about dark matter. It's much easier to go back to simple isolated galaxies. And when we look at the sample of galaxies, we know of about 150 of these systems right now. 
we find that they're dominated by lenses that are elliptical galaxies. Now it turns out that the, the properties of an elliptical galaxy you can mimic with a glass lens. So you can think of this, even though it's, the lensing is being done gravitationally, you can mimic the effects of the glass lens. The shape of the glass lens you need is something like this. Now I don't know about you, but to me that looks like the base of a wine glass. Perhaps that's just something about the way my mind works. Um, but if you have something with a shape like this, you can actually create Einstein rings. In fact, I challenge you, when you go home, to take a wine glass and tilt it slightly, if there's stuff in the wine glass, be careful, and hold it at a point source. So here's a picture I took on my smartphone of a wine glass, I had lemonade in it, honest, um, holding it in front of the television. And as you can see, I've made an Einstein ring. Okay? So it, has a, it has the same refractive properties as um, the elliptical galaxy. So that's the that's a sort of a whistle stop tour of how gravitational lensing works. How do we use it for weighing galaxies? Um, well, if you just want to measure the amount of mass, it's really simple. All you do is you measure the diameter of the Einstein ring, because the diameter of the Einstein ring is proportional to the square root of the mass. And again, another equation. Basically, the bigger the diameter, the more mass there is there. And this is incredibly precise. We can measure the mass of galaxies like this to within a few percent. It's one of the few observational tools that we have at our disposal that is so accurate for measuring mass. And when we do this, we find exactly the same sorts of um, problems that we find that the, um, Boris, um, Horace Parkock found, or Spicky found, that there's way too little mass there in terms of the visible mass that we can see in that elliptical galaxy to explain the size of that Einstein ring. It has to be about five or six or seven times more mass there than we can see to get an Einstein ring that's that big in this system. So that's how to measure the amount of mass, simple measurement can measure the diameter. If you want to measure how the mass is distributed, so is it a football-shaped galaxy or a rugby-shaped galaxy, um, you, the problem is a bit more tricky, because now we have to not just worry about the shape of the, the mass, but we also need to worry about the distribution of light as well. Okay? So, uh, a nice analogy here is, you know this security glass that used to be around in yesterday, a very, very wavy, wobbly security glass? Um, if someone were to stand behind that and you looked at their face, you get a distorted view of their face. In order to try and work out what they really look like, what they would look like through, through the glass, um, you need to know about the waves and the lumps and the bumps in the glass. Okay. And, but there's a problem here, right? It could be that that person really does look like, um, you know, sort of has a distorted face, and that the glass is a plain sheet of glass, right? That's one, that's one solution. Um, or it could be they have a more normal looking face um, and glasses look. So this, this is a tricky problem, it's something I've spent a long time working on, but it's something that we need to do if we want to worry about the shape of dark matter. Um, and by learning about the shape of dark matter, we learn about the, the physics that drives the formation of the universe. We learn about how galaxies form. So how do we so I've developed this technique? How do we know it works, right? What we're going to do is apply it to an observed image. Well, we can create a simulation and test it on a simulation. So this is what I'm, I'm showing you. So um, the top left plot is showing two galaxies, very, very pixelated view of two galaxies. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, with a computer, ray trace the light from these background sources to the observer and make an image of what we would see if we put a ruby ball shaped distribution of mass in front of it. And that's what the bottom image is. So this is a simulated image of an Einstein ring which is what we would see if an elliptical galaxy sat in front of that distribution. And that's what we see in the real universe. We, that's all we observe is an image of an Einstein ring like that. So the question is, can we get back that distribution of mass that I've used to make that image? And can I get back the light? Can I get back this double source? Well, when I, when I run this um, technique on this method, you can see, yes, I do. I get back the, the double source. It's noisy because we've added noise to the image. We started with a very clean background source. We've added noise to try and replicate what we would get with a real image from a real telescope. And so we get noise in the reconstructed source. But you can see that they, um, the main features are, are there. And furthermore, if we take 
what, what you haven't seen in this image is that it also tells you about the distribution of mass in the foreground lens. If we take that mass that this technique has, has figured out and we make a lensed image of that reconstructed source in the top right, we get the image in the bottom right. And the fact that the, the reconstructed image agrees with the observed image tells us that the whole thing is working, working properly. So I've, I've applied this um, technique for many, to many, many systems now. Um, one of the latest ones is um, an image of an Einstein ring that was taken with Alma. If you're not familiar with Alma, it's um, a very large and quite new interferometric array that is made up of about 60 antennas that uh, work at some of these wavelengths. These things are 12 meters across, and the whole array can be configured. They're picked up by these huge vehicles that have been purpose built for this, and then they're moved around to make different shapes. And, and by moving the, the antennas around and creating different shapes, you affect the imaging property of the telescope. So if you have them really widely separated, and, and they can go up to distances of 15 kilometers apart, you get really, really high resolution images, but they're a bit noisy. And if you bring them really close together, you get lower resolution, but higher signals noise images. So um, the, these trucks here that I'm showing you in the bottom right are actually huge. Bearing in mind the diameter of one of these, as I say, is 12 meters across, gives you an idea of how big these, these things actually are. But um, uh, I used Alma for imaging of um, a very famous um, Einstein ring. This is the observed image of the Einstein ring. You can see the exquisite resolution that we've observed this one. And then the picture on the right is a galaxy, is the galaxy that has been lensed by a foreground lens. So in, in doing this analysis, we've reconstructed what this background sort of looks like. And we've learned all sorts of really interesting physics about this, this galaxy. This is a galaxy that lies at a redshift of beyond three, which means the universe is about 10% of its current age. And we can measure the, the motion of the material in this galaxy, and we can measure how much of it there is there. And uh, what we're actually looking at, although it doesn't look like it is an edge on disk, the material is moving in an edge on disk, and it, but it's clumping. So this is the disk that we think is in the, the process of, of formation. None of this would be possible if it weren't for the fact that the foreground gravitational lens has basically given us this zoomed in view of the background source. Or we would see as something a few pixels wide if it weren't for the magnification factor of this lens. So the purpose of showing this is to point out that not only do we learn about the distribution of mass and dark matter, but we can also use these systems as what I call natural telescopes to get these super zoomed in views and learn about the formation of galaxies in the early universe. The future, where do we go from here? Well, as I said, we have at the moment a sample of around about 150 of these strong gravitational um, systems. But that's not really enough to really understand the mechanisms at play in the way in which galaxies are formed. But we're fortunate that we have two very major facilities coming online in, in the very near future that will completely um, enhance the known number of systems. So the first one is the Vera Rubin Observatory. It will carry out something called the Large Survey Space and time. Um, it's an 8 metre dish, it's being built in Chile, it's going to see the first light in just over a year. And we're going to go from this system, from a sample of 150 of these galaxy lens systems, to a sample of probably about 10,000 galaxies, uh, strong lenses. And then in about the same sort of time, we'll have the launch of Euclid. Um, just out of interest, this thing is going to produce a ridiculous amount of data every night. This telescope is going to produce 30 terabytes of imaging data. We're going to need some large storage to store those images. About the same sort of time Euclid will launch, that's going to detect 10 times again the number of strong lenses. So we're going to go from a sample of about 150 of these things to a sample of probably 100,000 of these things. Which sounds great, but this is a huge headache. This, this system here that I showed you took me, personally, using manual um, analysis techniques, a good week, maybe two weeks, to do. Okay? Multiply two weeks by 100,000, you get a very long length of time. It's not, it's not a tractable problem. We can't model all of these lenses by hand. Okay? So what we're now looking at is using artificial intelligence to do this for us. 
So artificial intelligence, you may have come across this, is very, very good at doing image classification. You can show an image and uh, something called a deep learning network, if it's being sufficiently well trained, can tell you what's in the image. So here are some examples. Um, there are pictures of aeroplanes across the top that the algorithms identified as aeroplanes. There's cats and dogs and all sorts of animals. We can use this kind of technology for modeling these lenses. And the reason for doing that is that using machine learning is, is way faster. In fact, I have a, a PhD student who's now he finished last week before last and submitted his thesis. He spent his entire PhD thesis working on this very, very problem. So the idea is we train a neural network to look at it as something like an Einstein ring image and tell us all about the properties of the Einstein ring. It can tell us about the distribution of mass in the lens. It can tell us about the, what the source looks like at the beam lens. The beauty of this is, as I say, it's way faster. So what would take me about a week, this thing can do well. I guess. How quickly do you think a neural network, if it takes me a week to model a stronger optical lens, how quickly do you think this thing will one? I guess. Hundreds of a second. Hundreds of a second, you're right. It'll do 20 lenses in one second. Right. So this is the level of technology that we need in order to um, continue this kind of work. I was hoping so. Yes. Yes. tens of thousands of images to train these kinds of algorithms. And we only know of 150 systems. The answer is we have to simulate them. So we have to we take the imaging characteristics of the telescope that um, we're going to use the algorithm on, and we try and replicate the physics and the imaging of, of the lens systems as best as possible in our simulations. But there is a problem there, because if we don't quite get our simulations right, then when we apply the algorithm to real data, problems can occur. So you've got to be extremely careful that your simulations are very, very lifelike. Yeah. Can you go back to the pictures of the lens uh, of the uh, mother? Mother. <laughs> that, one. that one. Yeah. Why are all the arts blue if the galaxies are further away? They should be more redshifted. Another excellent question. Um, the reason is that the light that it is redshifted, it's redshifted by an awful lot. It started out as UV, and it's been redshifted into the blue part of the optical spectrum. So these are all, they're all blue because of the way they've been selected. They've been selected because the detection technique looks for blue arcs. That's why they're all blue. Yeah. But these are all very, very young galaxies that are in the throes of creating massive stars that throw out a huge amount of UV radiation. But by the time it reaches us, it's been stretched into the blue part. Um, so, I mean, uh, I've, I've finished. Um, <clears throat> so my summary is um, that I've, I've given you an idea of dark matter, and that these observations seem to imply that there's way more mass there than um, we, can, we can see, and we know it's there by its uh, gravitational influence. We can measure the amount of this mass using gravitational lensing, and it's one of the best techniques to do it, so it's one of our best bets for being able to quantify this stuff. And the, problem, the reason why we do this is that when we compare our simulations of the universe with observations, we learn about physics. Okay? If the simulations don't match the observations, then that's because the physics is wrong. We need to twiddle the physics until we get something that agrees with what we really see in the universe. Um, but we don't just learn about the dark matter and the distribution of mass in the lens. We can use these things studying high redshift galaxies, so the, the strong lending systems act like natural telescopes. Um, and uh, just to remind you that um, the last thing I spoke about is that we are turning to artificial intelligence neural networks now to try and model the fast increase in the number of these things that we're going to see. That's me done. Thank you for listening. I'm